Was the Viking Danax for chopping down cavalry? Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So, I've actually devoted quite a few videos to the Danax, aka the Great Axe, of the late Viking era and into the Norman era, um, and in the past. So if you haven't seen those, check those out. But recently I did a video talking about pole axes and Danaxes and other related things. And a comment came up, in fact a couple of comments came up there, which reminded me of something. And this was uh, compounded by the fact that I was also doing some filming for a TV company, we'll talk about that another time, which also touched on these as well. And uh, there are numerous history books, and I think partly inspired by the Bayeux Tapestry, and we'll come back to that in a minute, that talk about these as specialised weapons with which the Vikings, and later on the Anglo-Saxons, brought down Norman cavalry or uh, Frankish cavalry earlier on. And that this was a weapon which was devised for that purpose. Do I think that that is correct? Well, the answer's partially mm, probably not, but I'm gonna caveat that. Now, why would I say probably not? I have always railed against this, this idea that this is an anti-cavalry weapon. Why is that? Quite simply, because in the Anglo-Saxon Frankish Viking era, we have got a really, really good anti-cavalry weapon already in existence. And the fact is that throughout this um, period, spears were the absolute go-to weapon. They were what 95% of your infantry are equipped with, and in fact the cavalry as well. So if you've got a load of guys with spears, why would you need one of these to contend with cavalry? Moreover, is this any good against cavalry? Well, this is a somewhat more complicated question, in fact, because we do actually have some evidence, annoyingly, sort of, because it, it kind of messes with my opinions and my argument, but I am a historian at heart and an archeologist, and so I have to refer to the source material. So what evidence do we have? First of all, we've got written evidence. We've got written descriptions of two-handed axes, uh, for example, from the Battle of Hastings being used to bring down uh, Norman horses. Moreover, we've literally got artistic evidence of it as well because it is shown in the Bayer Tapestry. But here's the problem. All of this is about the Battle of Hastings. It's about 1066. It's about William the Conqueror. Now, William the Conqueror's army was characterised, at least from an Anglo-Saxon, from an English history point of view, by the fact that he had lots of cavalry there. This was unusual. For those of you who don't know, Anglo-Saxon armies fought on foot. The primary kind of contrast between the Anglo-Saxon or English army and the Norman and Breton army that was invading in 1066 at Hastings was the fact that one side had a huge number of horses and cavalry, you know, people who knew how to fight on them, and the other side probably had absolutely none at all. Now, why is that? We don't really know exactly why. The fact is that the northern Germanic tribes, the people who inhabited uh, England, the people who uh, inhabited Scandinavia, the northern Germans, the Danes, they don't seem to have really used cavalry. Now, there are some debated exceptions to this. There are some examples from written sources where it describes the Anglo-Saxon army sweeping down on their enemies, for example, the Vikings, uh, sweeping down on a horseback. But the implication is that they arrived on horseback and dismounted and fought. In fact, all of the descriptive accounts, for example, the Battle of Malden, uh, various um, various other Anglo-Saxon sources describe people fighting on foot. They never really describe people fighting on horseback, and there's no pictorial evidence to support it, and there's no archaeological evidence to support it. The fact is that large horses didn't really exist in Anglo-Saxon England. It was the Normans that brought them over. Okay, the Romans had brought horses over long, long time in the past, and there were probably some larger horses available to Anglo-Saxons, probably imported from places like Brittany and Normandy. But by and large, they weren't indigenous to the British Isles. We had small ponies. We had little Dartmoor ponies and things like that. We could have ridden around, but we always would have been outmatched, certainly by Norman cavalry riding bloody great horses. So... And that was true in Scandinavia as well. And when we read descriptions of the uh, Viking uh, era wars, the wars between the, the Danes and the, the Norse and the English, 
there's never any real mention of anything concrete and firm to suggest that cavalry was being used. Now, if we go across, I don't want to be too Anglo-centric here, which is something I get accused of sometimes. If we go across the channel to the Frankish Empire, the Carolingian Empire, the empire founded by uh, Charlemagne, well, you could say Charles Martel, um, but uh, Charlemagne and then people like Louis the Pious and all the people that came after, they were also fighting the Vikings. Now, we just in case you didn't know, this is very much a weapon associated with particularly the Danish and the Norse, okay, with the Vikings, the people that we now call the Vikings. Um, although that's a problematic term, we'll call them the Vikings because it's easy. So this is a, essentially a two-handed Viking axe. So these people in Scandinavia and uh, Denmark developed this specialised weapon. Was it for fighting the Franks? Um, now, the Franks definitely did have cavalry, and in fact, that's why William the Conqueror had cavalry in 1066, because despite the fact that, yes, he was descended in one part of his family line from, uh, from Vikings, the rest of his family line was Norman. So he was kind of Frankish, really. Um, and culturally, you know, he spoke a form of French, Norman French, and they fought in essentially the Frankish way with um, lots of cavalry and... Um, a fair number of archers as well, and archers were another thing which at this point weren't really part of English or Scandinavian uh, warfare very much. So, we've got very contrasting military technologies. The question is, do we think that people in Scandinavia, places like Norway and Denmark and, and uh, Sweden and uh, Finland, developed this weapon specifically for fighting the Franks? I can't see it. I, I honestly can't see why they would, because within their own country, where this weapon developed, they're fighting each other. They're not fighting cavalry, they're fighting other shield walls and other other Vikings. In England, they're fighting people who fight very similarly to them with large round shields fighting in shield walls on foot. They don't have cavalry. The only place, really, that they were fighting a lot, where they encountered a lot... I mean, we could talk about the Byzantine Empire and we could talk about, you know, North Africa and, and Spain and places like this, but fundamentally, in terms of kind of statistically, the main place they were fighting where they did encounter cavalry was Francia. Okay, but I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that this was a specialised weapon for dealing with Frankish horse. And moreover, as I've already mentioned, they've already got spears. Why do you need to develop this if you're already armed with spears, which are perfectly good at dealing with cavalry. And later on, the answer to cavalry, if we look at later medieval period, which is better documented, whether it's the Scottish Chiltern or the um, Swiss um, pike blocks or halberdiers or whatever, we're dealing with long pointy pole arms, basically. So I don't think that this was developed to counter cavalry, especially as it's got no top spike. And really, if you imagine someone on horse, and I think this is a really important point, okay? So if you phased out at this point, pay attention to this bit. Cavalry have lances, so cavalry have spears. If you're standing on foot with a two-handed axe, the spear on horseback is always going to be able to outreach you. So before you've got your swing in at that horse's head or legs or at the rider, they're going to be skewering you with a lance. It doesn't seem to make much sense, okay? So there's my basic argument, but here comes the caveat and the problem to, to my argument and the thing which undermines it. And this shows, I hope this shows some degree of historic humility because I could just stop the video there and I've made my argument, I've made my point. Here is the counter argument. The counter argument is number one, we have these sources written and pictorial showing these two-handed axemen taking down horses at the Battle of Hastings. So we know it probably happened, or at least they believed it happened and they wrote about it happening. Moreover, the written sources were so impressed by these axes and they describe, you know, a rider and his horse being chopped down by them. So that's the first thing. Secondly, we do also have other ethnographic and other historical comparisons, such as what? I'll just put the Danax down for a minute. So first of all, we have in Europe, two-handed swords later on. And these swords are, while they're not primarily described as anti-cavalry we weapons, are also sometimes described being used against cavalry, in conjunction with spearmen and halberdiers, incidentally. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. Moreover, if we go all the way over to East Asia, if we go to China, then we have a comparison with the so-called 
horse cutting swords. So if we go to China, these massive 200 swords were described as horse cutting swords. Now that there is some debate about that. Were they described as that because they were capable of chopping through a horse? Or were they described as that because they were used against cavalry or to defend against cavalry? Or were they described against that for some other reason that we haven't worked out yet? We don't know, uh, but they are described as horse cutting swords. So here's the problem. We have large, but not massively long, not as long as spears and halberds and, uh, and other pole arms like that. We have got two-handed sword or two-handed axe, and actually these are quite comparable in reach. We've got two-handed choppy things, choppy boys, if we call them that, that are allegedly perhaps used against cavalry and are in their own time and even in language and written sources described as anti-cavalry weapons. So where does that leave us? This is a problem because first of all, I don't think historically these were necessarily developed to fight against cavalry, but that doesn't mean that they weren't thereafter used to fight against cavalry. Okay, so even though the big two-handed sword in China might have been developed for one purpose, for example, bodyguards, and I'll come back to that point, and maybe this was designed as the berserkers or house carls or retainers, you know, specialized noble weapon, and I think it probably was, and I'll come back to that as well. It doesn't mean that it wasn't therefore used against cavalry. How was it used against cavalry? With spears. I think it has to have been. So what we might be looking at, and I think there's some support, perhaps if you look at Bayer Tapestry um, in this, and perhaps even if you look at the Chinese sources, that what you would have is you would have a group of people who were predominantly armed with spear and shield. If they were threatened by incoming cavalry, the guys with the axes might hang around behind the shield wall or spear block, if you want to call it that, pike block, and then when the horses came crashing in and disrupted that block, they might charge through, leap through, and start chopping down man and rider. And I think that this, and you could do that with two-handed sword as well, uh, if you didn't have a two-handed axe. I think this is plausible, and that's just a theory. I need more evidence. It'd be nice to find some written evidence that corroborates that. But that's a theory. I think if these were used against cavalry, and true of the two-handed sword as well, they have to be used in conjunction as part of a combined weapon system with pole arms such as pike spears or halberds. Okay, that's the first thing. Finally, final part of the video, I think what were these developed for? I don't think they were developed originally for fighting cavalry, even if they were subsequently used that way sometimes. If we look at the art, um, Again, if we come back to bare tapestry or indeed the written sources, for, specifically for these axes, not talking necessarily about those swords, although you could apply to both. I think there is a lot of evidence to support that these were originally developed for bodyguards. OK, they were developed for house cars, as they were called. Now, if we look at the bare tapestry, it seems that the royal bodyguard carried these, the people close to the king or the earl, people who were around the figureheads. So your most important nobles would have personal retainers who were essentially a miniature standing army. Unlike most of the army, which was raised and levied when it needed to be when there was an invasion, these guys were permanently on hand. They were paid just to be soldiers. They were kind of like knights or samurai of later period. Okay, And they seem to have been armed with these. Why? Well, because it's a specialised and fearsome weapon, uh, which probably strikes fear into the hearts of the enemy, but used in conjunction with your traditional spear and shield armed troops, you can probably use it in some quite interesting tactical ways, both as shock troops and as last ditch defence. And if we now come to the European two-handed sword, the montante or spadone, we get some clues because in that period, this weapon holds a very similar position, either with the lance connect or with uh, bodyguards used on the top of ships to prevent uh, borders or people used to protect bridges or passes. Um, it seems that this was a last ditch defense, protect the rear while the king or the earl escapes. So the bodyguard can occupy a large amount of attackers with this type of weapon by, twir by whirling it around and occupying them uh, at the same time. And that therefore is a very good troop, uh, very good weapon to give to your personal bodyguard. In later periods, you see things like glaives and, and those uh, you and partisans as well used for bodyguards. And if we come back to the 
Battle of Stamford Bridge. So we're still in 1066, we're still in William the Conqueror era, but this is the Battle of Stamford Bridge, which happened just before the Battle of Hastings. We have one lone account of that Viking axeman on the bridge holding off the English army while Harold Hardrada's survivors tried to escape. And apparently, you know, one, one source I've read says that he cut down 40 men and he was eventually speared from below, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, this is exactly what I'm just describing. It's exactly how these montantes and spadones were described being used in the 16th century. It is by the very hardcore, big, strong, specially recruited professional bodyguard. And you say to him, look, mate, I'm really sorry, but we've got to do a runner and get back to the ship because our army's just been defeated. Hold that bridge for as long as you can. Go down fighting. Don't surrender. And this is the weapon that you give to them for that purpose. And another clue if we look at Bayer Tapestry is if we actually look at Harold Godwinson and various other nobles in the uh, English uh, side, you can see them often standing around with their great axes. So it's also a weapon of prestige and high status, like a sword. And it seems to have been in that period the weapon associated both with the house carls, the personal royal bodyguard, and the actual royals themselves, potentially a weapon that the, that the lords sometimes carried, a bit like, you know, long swords later on. Uh, and very briefly, it seems to some extent large two-handed swords might have occupied a similar place in China as well and being given to bodyguards uh, and being used in a similar capacity to two-handed swords uh, in Europe. Anyway, I hope that's given you some stuff to think about. Therefore, you know, in as a rough sort of brief summary, I don't think these were developed as anti-cavalry weapons, as some modern books have said or some TV shows have said. But I do think they were definitely used that way sometimes. I think they must have been used combined with the spearmen in order to work. Otherwise, they'd always be outranged and outreached by the lancer on horseback. But finally, I think the primary purpose of why they developed was essentially as a bodyguard's weapon, much similar to the later massive Zweihander two-handed sword. I hope that's been thought-provoking. Uh, if you disagree, or if you know some other sources that might be exactly pertinent to this point or to this question or prove me wrong or prove me right then get posting below and i look forward to your contributions i have been matt easton i will continue to be and hopefully i'll see you back on the channel really really soon cheers folks thanks for watching we've got extra videos on patreon please give our facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already cheers folks